much. Hello, everybody. Um, since it was, uh, excuse me, uh, it was a TED event, so I thought I was obliged to perform it in English, so I prepared myself in English. I will try to speak uh, as clearly as possible. So, when you look at the program of this meeting and see that the doctor is uh, about to talk on engineering the future, you may expect that you will hear on complicated issues like surgical robots, gene therapy, or biomedical engineering. If this is the case for you, you will see that my talk looks rather like the famous Tunisian sandwich with tuna, in which you often do not find that much tuna. And, uh, I don't know if I perform my set of slides, okay. Or, right and left, okay, thank you. Or, when you look at this uh, uh, traffic indication, and think that Cairo is around the corner from Tunis. <laughs> Indeed, I'm just, sorry, I'm just going to tell you stories. Like the, tell, uh, the storytellers of our uh, childhood. And the first short story is, uh, happened to three people from three different countries. The question for these three people was, what is your opinion on the shortage of meat, on the lack of meat in the country? The possible answers were, well, the answers given by the three people were, for the person who lived in a rich country, he said, what is shortage? The one coming from a country under famine said, what is meat? And the one in a country under dictatorship said, what is opinion? So you can see, sorry, I just, uh, is there a last pointer? Okay. Top here? This one? Okay. So, priorities and future vision, vision would depend on the environment where we are. And this is true for medicine. Okay? And we cannot envision the future without reference to our uh, environment. So, okay, may I ask you a question? When you are ill, where you could do? Either you go to see, to pray, or you can go to see a wizard, or a quack doctor, or choose to see a real doctor, a normal one. In case you choose to see a normal doctor, he will use various tools to help you with your health problems. And among these tools he could see, he would, he, he would use his experience, his education as a doctor, but also a lot of other tools, such as needles, plants, pills, and uh, also very complicated drugs and machines, is it? So, if we want to speak on engineering the future of medicine, that's why I was invited for, we should look at how we could link the engineering by itself with medicine. And that's how more and more doctors are, have to deal with more and more complicated machines and need to do more than, uh, to, to learn more than medicine. Okay, now another story. Have you heard of the word Sarandib? No. Okay, me too, a few years ago didn't know it, but now I know it very well. Okay, Sarandib is the ancient Arab word for Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka, where took place a very beautiful story, I'm going to tell you. This story is the tale of the three princes of Serendip. This tale, I will be very short, says that these three princes were sons of a very powerful king. And they were very intelligent. And the king decided, because his, his sons have learned a lot of arts, a lot of science, said they need to learn empirical things, to have experience, and to see what is the real, the real world, the real life. So he uh, put them out of his kingdom and said, do it by yourself, like said the uh, author, I think. So, and when they, they reached the, the kingdom called Bahram, the, the kingdom of Bahram, another powerful emperor, they, uh, they met a, a camel driver who, who have, had lost a camel. 
And he, uh, he asked them, have you seen my common? They said, we didn't see any common, but we think that on this road passed a common who is blind in one eye, okay, and who has a missing tooth and who is lame. So, okay. hearing this, the, 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 the common driver was convinced that they stole his common. So, he get them imprisoned. And it was when a neighbor found the lost camel that they were released. And when released, they went, they were presented to Bahram, the powerful king of that uh, empire. And Bahram said, how could you uh, describe so precisely a thing you have never seen? And the reply of the three princes demonstrated to this, uh, to this king that they were very intelligent. They said, we have seen, we, we suppose that this common was blind of one eye because the grass, less verdant on the side of a road, was eaten, and the more verdant grass was not. So we thought he is blind of the other eye. And we thought that this common had a missing tooth because we saw shoot uh, small uh, grass, but uh, this looks like if there was a missing tooth from which this uh, should the grass has fallen. And we thought that it is blame because we saw on the tracks only three prints. The other one was training after these three uh, uh, prints, so we concluded that the garment is blame. And that's how this Bahram, this powerful king, uh, invited this princess to be his guest, and the rest of the story tells us how he used their intelligence to enhance his own, own power and to solve his own problem. And the story is longer than that, but the important is that from this story are derived three concepts very important to science and research. The, these concepts are the concept of serendipity, bahramity, and zemblamity. Okay, funny words, but very important concepts. I'm going to tell you how. Serendipity is defined by the Oxford Dictionary as the occurrence and development of events by chance in a happy or beneficial way. I personally, as a scientist, do not agree with this definition. I would qualify uh, as a happy uh, and beneficial uh, event, for example, the fact that my son will become a chemist. I just can't believe it. I'm very happy. Chemistry is very complicated. And I, I don't know how people can do chemistry. I would qualify that, for example, my daughter is being to become a humanitarian a person and work in the field of, uh, of humanitarian aid. I can't believe it. But the real reality for me is that serendipity is when you have the wisdom to recognize and move with the unexpected. You are a scientist, you find something unexpected, you recognize it's important and you move with it. And the ability to accumulate knowledge and understanding and to move sideways rather than in a linear way. It also requires peripheral vision and not just looking forward eyesight. So, why serendipity is important in science? Most of the discovery important for humanity has, has been made by serendipity. And it is important to know that these people who found a lot of things by serendipity, the Americas, uh, Pasteur, uh, Einstein, and so on, they found it because they learned a lot on their own science, and they were prepared to encounter this little accident, this different thing that led them to more important discoveries. The other concept is the Bahram Dipiti, derived from the, the name of this, this emperor who used these people to, um, to uh, increase his power. In fact, it's, it looks for me like more self-serving promotion of a discovery and its discoverer by a more powerful individual. I will tell you later on how you all, all of us, encounter people with Bahram Dipiti. And then, from where comes the word, the word zemblanity. 
In fact, it is the story, sorry, the story of the uh, Nuva Zimbla Island, a very desolated island, like you see in the picture, uh, very, very, uh, very north in the Arctic. And in this island, uh, there was, uh, there William Barrett stranded with his crew and was unhappy and uh, it was really uh, difficult for them to deal with the, the stranding of their boat. That is why the term Zemblanity was coined to mean somewhat the opposite of Serendi. Nova Zembla being the opposite of Serendi. And uh, I think when I was a young doctor, uh, I didn't know these words. That's why I want to share with you this concept. Uh, but I, what I'm sure of is that I encountered all three concepts. Okay, serendipity manifested when, as told by the presenter, uh, I won the, uh, the American Academy uh, Award of Neurology because I started my studies on Parkinson's disease a few years before the discovery of the first gene involved in Parkinson's disease. So it was the right moment. And I was, let's say, strong enough, or I don't know what, to say I'm sure that my discoveries are true because the collection of Tunisian patients is very important and we uh, confirm that there is in the world another form of Parkinson's disease than the one described in European and American journals. And I thought of that very strongly and finally the discovery of G this gene in 99 allowed other people to be confident in my result finally and to give me this uh, award. So there's a kind of serendipity for having work on that subject at that moment. I also certainly encountered the kind of zemblanity when, okay, you are going to laugh, for three months I was performing uh, lab experiments and uh, it didn't work. And I spent three months repeating each day the same design uh, and no success for my experiments. And to discover finally, after three years of the three months of the planet, that one of the chemicals I was using was just preempted for months. This is the planet, okay? And uh, I also encountered by antiquity because I failed to protect my data, to protect my results. And the virginity of a more powerful person in my field than me uh, made that the the subject slipped into other hands. Anyway, for me, I, the opportunities of collaboration in the world were great. They affluent from, from all, all over the world. And then, because I wasn't aware of the Bahram DPT, this subject slipped into other Tunisian hands. But anyway, until now, my collection of patients and my data allows to help find great discovery in genetics of Parkinson's disease. And more important for me, even if it's not me who finished this work, it gave to my country a better reputation in uh, scientific research and in neurogenetics. When you see the neurology school of Tunisia, you, you just open, you see a lot of things on that in the world. Now, just take home message of my story, or the stories I told you, including mine is that if you want to engineer your future, you, you have to believe in it. And you have to think that one day or another, if you engineer your own future, you will be able to engineer and shape your field of competence in your country. This is the most important. Uh, that's why uh, I, I try to, to have some rules on my story. The first rule is free your mind. Do never anything is impossible. Do never think anything is impossible. Second, be innovative and at the first time. Even uh, if you are, are not always understood, but try not to, go, to be that far from the rest of the group to be understood. And I think the other rule is to adapt to your environment. Uh, this picture represents an extreme adaptation to the environment with the soldier here on this uh, couch, but there are in the nature other intermediate figures to inspire us. And be prepared for the zemblanity when it happens, because it is part of the science. And finally, 
learn how to detect in your mentor's protective attitude some kind of Bahram GPT. That's why I thought that these words were important to know for all of us because they are important in science. Now I'm going to tell you a very short story. It's the story of a, a young engineer from the ENIT and his tutors who thought exactly like me and thought that the future of medicine is anti enter the future in general of science is interdisciplinarity and multidisciplinarity. And they came to my lab and uh, I had to conduct a work. I'm really not able to interpret these curves. But what I know is that this helped us to invent uh, better tools to explore uh, our children. This is a kind of um, collaboration. The other uh, kind of um, important interdisciplinarity and multidisciplinarity is related to what is called the deep brain stimulation. What is deep brain stimulation? Okay, it's again a small story, very short. When uh, in 92 I was with my husband in Paris, he is neurosurgeon, and we learned, as a neurologist, we learned the first important technique in treating Parkinson's disease by using a lot of engineering materials, but of course by using clinical and surgery. But this is a very important uh, example of multidisciplinarity. And we uh, managed to treat uh, Tunisian patients. Of course, we learned this technique in 92. The first Tunisian patient was operated in 90, uh, nine, uh, 2005. 13 years lost because of a lot of zemblanity administrative zemblanity, we were of that, and because of a few Bahram DBT, because we were too young, too powerless, and we were not able to impose a new technique by ourselves. So this patient was unable to move, unable to walk, and now he is even joking with us. Another example is the story of a powerful poison that became a powerful medication. Here again, serendipity allowed us to learn the technique very early. And we introduced uh, the, this technique in Tunisia. And just let me show you what you are doing for now more than 20 years with this product. Sorry. Uh, I don't know. The other one, how can we make it work? So this, the patient after treatment, this technique was new when we learned it, but it was introduced in due, due time in our country. And to uh, conclude, just if you want to engineer your future, think you are strong even if disarmed. In powerless countries, the only real power is brains. So overuse yours, or let's overuse ours. The other thing is that the era of the solitary uh, researcher has passed, and now together we are smarter. So if I had a take home message, I would like just to say a little bit. Small quotes, especially the one that pleases me from Einstein, telling that the distinction between the past, the present, and the future is a persistent illusion. That's why I presented a talk on engineering the future by just telling stories from the past. Thank you very much.